turn now to Jonah chapter 1. We'll be walking through verses 1 through 3 this morning as we begin this new and exciting book. Jonah chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Truth is, dear friends, the book of Jonah is likely a book and a story in the Bible that you feel very familiar with. Possible this has become because this is such a favorite in children's stories. There's a danger, though. There, there's a danger in familiarity with biblical passages because sometimes it takes away the true message of the story. That in giving this to children, we sanitize it in certain ways, and the message that is there is forgotten. But in our familiarity, we feel as though we really understand this story. And it's interesting. It's interesting, dear friends, is it not, how some of these stories become favorites of children's stories. I've long been fascinated by the fact that the Great Flood is a favorite children's story. I've even seen toys back when there was a Lifeway. There was a toy section in Lifeway, and in the toy section they had Noah and the Ark, a toy for the children to play with, and it had different animals, and it had Noah and his family. Many times if you go through a church building and you see the children's area, you will see an entire mural painted Sometimes you have uh, Jonah and the great fish. Oftentimes you also have the ark and Noah, something that's even coloring sheets that the children will be coloring. The flood is a very difficult story. The flood is not a joyful story. It, It is sanitized in such ways that it's kind of the idea that, well, here's a man that he gathered this these animals in the ark, and it was this fun time. It was a terrible time. It was a awful time in human history. You don't see that on the coloring sheets. Now, some of you may say, wait a second, we have some more theologically accurate coloring sheets. We actually have the people who perished on the coloring sheets. Okay, you're odd. That is a strange thing to have. There are a great many stories in the Bible that don't need to be on children's coloring sheets, even though it may be more theologically accurate. It was a terrible time. It was a time of great stress for Noah. Think about this. Noah spent his fortune, he was a wealthy man, I do believe, building a great ark and bringing upon it these animals. And everyone that was not on that ark perished. Everyone. Everyone that Noah knew. Most likely the people who helped him build the ark. There's no way. I don't believe that Noah cut up all the wood and built that giant ark. On his own, he was a wealthy man, most likely, and he hired others to be building this ark and creating this ark. They might have thought he was crazy as he was doing it, but there were many jobs that were provided at that time, and the ark lands and everything has been destroyed. God has judged humanity, and this is something that is pointing forward to the great judgment that will happen in the future, that there will be some who are saved from this judgment, and the others that are outside of the ark, outside of the protection of Christ, will absolutely perish. We do have a beauty there. There's a beautiful part of that story. There is the grace of God there in the ark and those that were protected and those that were saved. 
Not because of Noah's internal righteousness. We see his behavior as soon as he gets on, off of the ark and how he acted. And his, one of his first activities was to go and to make wine and to get intoxicated. This wasn't a man who was saved by his own righteousness. He was trusting in the Messiah who was to come. We have here in this story... The story of Noah, the story of Jonah, rather, the story that we are so, so familiar with. We have a story of a man who runs, a man who believes he knows what is best, and we have a God who pursues, a God who pursues this man, a loving God, a merciful God, a kind God. Sinclair Ferguson says this about the book. He says, It is really a book about how one man came through a painful experience to discover the true character of the God whom he already served in the earlier years of life. He was to find about the doctrine about God, which he had long been familiar with, to come alive in his personal experience. I'm looking forward to walking through this book, and I pray that this will be a blessing for all of you as well as we begin to unpack the pages of this familiar story. And there's three points that I want to pull out from this passage here, these three verses. The first is the word of the Lord. We see the Lord bring his word to Jonah, Jonah as a prophet, getting the word of God, being commanded to go and bring this word Secondly, we see the evil before the Lord, that the evil of the Ninevites was there before the Lord. He was not blind to it. He would have been right to smite them, to strike them. But in his mercy, he was sending a messenger to them. Thirdly, we see the presence of the Lord. How in disobedience, Jonah flees from God. He flees from the presence of God like Adam and Eve, who were leaving the presence of the Lord in the garden, walking because of their disobedience. First, we see the word of the Lord in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of of Amati, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. The word of the Lord had been given to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. A prophet being one who was commissioned by God to receive the word of God and then to go forward and proclaim that word to other people. This is a unique office. This is not a place where all children of God exist. All people who work in ministry do not exist in this capacity as a prophet. Everyone doesn't receive the Word of God in this way. Don't believe others that may tell you that this is the ordinary means that God is giving His Word to people. We we as a people, though, need to remember that we are incredibly blessed. We are blessed to have the Word of God here within our language, not just in our language. We have numerous translations in our language That's something I pray that it doesn't become common to you. It doesn't become something that is just rote or ordinary, that you recognize how you stand in such a great contrast to the vast majority of all people who who have ever existed on this planet, that you have the total canon of Scripture in your language, that you can easily access it there on your dining room table, there on your cell phone, on your iPad, so, so easily. Dear friends, don't let this become common for you. But hear this, dear friends, although we have such easy access to the Word of God, we too don't always listen to what the Word of God says. See, Jonah here was a man who was given the Word of God, and the Word of God came directly to him, and he defied what the Word of God said to him. This isn't something he was new to, at least I don't believe that it was. He's someone, I believe, who had been serving as a prophet. He had been working in the northern kingdom for For some time, he had been speaking to them about the ways in which the Lord would even bless them. The northern kingdom was a rebellious people. 
they would have deserved the Lord to send them into exile many years earlier than he had, but he had shown patience with them. He had given them mercy. And this mercy that the Lord had been giving to the northern kingdom, this great prophet Jonah was not willing to give that to another people. Jonah is a prophet who was uh, a protege of Elijah and Elisha, most likely trained there in the school of prophets. These are two other great prophets of the northern kingdom that came right before Jonah came on the scene. And just remember, as a bit of history, Israel had broken into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom uh, shortly after the time where so- after Solomon uh, had died. And they had basically a civil war had broken out, and ten tribes stayed in the north, but the southern kingdom continued to have the Davidic dynasty, and it was Judah and Benjamin that were in the southern kingdom. And they were separated there until they came back from exile. Jonah's response here is interesting. It's a very unique response. It's almost uh, the diametrically opposed to the way you see Jeremiah respond to the Word of God when it is given to him. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, he says this, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot was the very opposite for Jonah. Jonah was given the word of God and he turned the other direction. He runs the other direction. He basically draws a line and says, okay, I need to go over here to Assyria to the east. I'm going to go as far west as I can. And he went and found a ship that was heading to Tarshish, which is most likely in Spain, which is as far west as you could get in the known world at that time. No, friends, I think a lot of us might, might say that, well, I would have responded differently. If God was talking directly to me, if the Word of God was given directly to me, and I heard God's voice, then I would respond differently. Dear friends, so oftentimes our problems spiritually are not merely just a matter of the intellect. See, it's not as though Jonah received this Uh, order from the Lord. It's not as though the word of the Lord came to him and he needed to go back to his study and consult some of his commentaries. He began to look at how some of the other teachers and prophets in the past might have dealt with what the Lord is saying here. The word of the Lord was very clear. He knew what the Lord was calling him to do. It's his heart that desired not to be obedient He didn't desire to submit himself to the Word of God. He wanted to be his own sovereign. He wanted there to be a God, but he wanted the God to be at his beck and call. A God that was civilized in the way that he believed that religion should be civilized. Accepting of the people that he desires to be accepted and not going beyond that. We need to be cautious here as well. Another warning I want to give is that we don't think higher of men than we should. You know, there's times at which, you know, people will be looking at, you know, what God would have them do in their lives, or even considering how it is that they should be obedient. And they will think that the way in which they can be obedient is to have an official position in some way, some type of an office within the church. And there's this mistaken idea that the people that are front and center, the people that are office holders, the people that are serving in very active and open ways are the people that will be receiving the greatest rewards in heaven. I think that's incredibly misguided. I don't believe there's scripture to support that. Our goal should not be to be front and center. Our goal should be to walk in the role that the Lord has given us. If the Lord has called you to occupy such a position, then trust God and faithfully serve in the places where he has put you. But wherever he has put you, your call is to be obedient. Your call is to submit to the word of God. We even have warnings of such things in the New Testament. There, there are people who should not be serving in a teaching ministry. They should not be working in the area of 
preaching. James gives such a warning in James 3 in verse 1. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. It's important that we see and consider and look where the Lord has called us and that we seek to be faithful there. Jonah is a man who was given much and much will be expected of such a man. And the word of God was given to this man and he is walking in a way that is disobedient. We should see this. We should see the ways in which we are living in a way that is disobedient to what the Lord is commanding us because we will find excuses. We will find a rationale for what we are doing that is contrary to what we know the Word of God says. We will see that Jonah has his own reasons. So we see the Word of God given there to Jonah. Secondly, we see evil before the Lord. We see that in verses 1 through 3 in Jonah chapter 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amatai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. This strange, strange response, strange way that he has acted here at this time. And as we said earlier, Jonah's problem isn't one that's primarily one of an intellectual understanding. He understands what the Lord is telling him to do. And something that I've always found fascinating about the Word of God is when you compare it with other major books of religion in the world, is how the Bible doesn't sugarcoat the sins of its heroes That's not what happens. We have Jonah being laid out as a man who is openly sinning, openly rebelling against the Word of God, and the Lord still using this man by His grace and mercy for His purpose. We see Moses as one who was a man who lacked faith in what God could do, didn't trust God in how He could use him, even though he wasn't confident in how he could speak. We see Moses as one who didn't trust God and the Word of God and acted on his own and resulted in him murdering another man. We see the great King David, who was one who stole the wife of another man and took the life of that man. The Bible doesn't shy away from the sins in the ways that so many other books will, in the ways in which you will see these people put forward in such perfection. And that's because there's not a righteous person in Scripture after the fall except for Christ. But even still, Jonah's response is strange, is it not? Why would he act in this way? You know, in children's stories, it's often put forward that, you know, he just didn't like these people. They were different than he was, and he didn't want to be around people that were different. And I don't think that's a very accurate picture There are great examples of the wickedness of the Ninevites that are given there in Nahum. Nahum, a prophet who would proclaim judgment against the Ninevites. For the Ninevites would end up falling because of their own sin. But they would be saved here for a time. For about a hundred years, the city would be saved because of their repentance, because of the preaching of Jonah. But the evil of the Ninevites was renowned in the world. They were a very sick people. This was the capital of the Assyrian um, Empire. And this was a people that was very sadistic, very disturbed in the way in which they would treat people when they invaded their area. It's one of the oldest cities there in Assyria, going back all the way to Genesis chapter 10. One commentator mentions this. He says that Nineveh's size is mentioned not to emphasize the difficulty of the task, but to emphasize its importance and the greatness of the wickedness that is there. Now, this is something that I want you to see was very personal for Jonah. Jonah, as a man who came from the town of gath Hafed. And that's one that suffered under great oppression from the Assyrian Empire. These are a people who were terrorizing 
his people. There are most likely people that Jonah loves, that Jonah cares for very greatly, that are important to him, that he knows of, that were injured, that were killed, whose lives were damaged in great ways because of the actions of the Assyrians. So this is no small command for Jonah when he is told to go forward and he is told to go and to proclaim um, the truth before them. And he is told to go and to declare that in 40 days Nineveh will be brought down, that they will be destroyed. And he knows this. He knows that God is a loving God. He knows that God is a merciful God. He knows that God had been merciful to the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was incredibly wicked. The people of Israel would go on to sin prior to them being removed from the promised land. They would go on to sin in ways that the Canaanites had not even imagined. It is unbelievable the ways in which they began to sin, the ways in which that slippery slope of sin began to affect them individually and as a culture. I believe that's Jonah's fear. Jonah's fear here is that these Ninevites are going to repent and the city is going to be saved. And these people are going to end up invading his area, his hometown. This northern kingdom is going to be attacked because these people were allowed to live. See, but God here is pursuing even these people. These people who are running from him, who are fleeing from the righteousness of God, who have no desire to walk in truth, who have no desire to be a proper image bearer, of God. Even them, the Lord here is pursuing him, pursuing them. This isn't a story about a little boy that didn't want to play with children that are a little bit different than he is. This is much like the story of the Samaritans in the New Testament. We have such a distorted view of Samaritans. I am a member of a group called Samaritans Ministries, and it is kind of like a Christian co-op for uh, health needs, and you have a need, and you can begin to submit it, and it comes from the story of the Good Samaritan. And we're so familiar with that story that we just associate in a Samaritan as someone who is a good person, a kind person, a person who is going the extra mile for someone else. That's not how the first century Jews would have viewed the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a people who had acted in ways that were very terroristic, where they were attacking women and children, where they were attacking and they were undermining the very people of God. And you see the Lord reaching out even to those people, walking through the land of Samaria, talking there with the Samaritan woman. That's Jonah's real concern here. Jonah's real concern here is that these people will be saved, that they will go on to live another day. And that's what will happen. It's absolutely what's going to happen. Jonah is going to preach to these people. They're going to repent. They're going to turn from their evil ways. There's going to be people that are saved out of this group, people I believe that will be in glory. And the descendants of these people will go on to invade the northern kingdom and drag Jonah's people into exile after Jeremiah has preached and preached and preached to the people. They will not listen. They will not repent. They will continue in their sinful ways. They will continue listening to the prophets that merely tickle their ears and they will be removed as the Lord declares they will. Jonah is aware of this. Jonah has a real concern here. You know, the, the thing is, though, Jonah's not seeing this rightly. Jonah's not seeing these sins of his people rightly. All cultures, dear friends, all cultures have their favorite sins to hate. 
And from generation to generation, they will change. We have our favorite sins to hate at this time, and the sins at this time that you are most supposed to hate, and the sins at this time can, that can absolutely have no forgiveness for would be someone who abuses a child in some way, someone who violates someone else, or lastly, someone who is racist in some ways. And those are all terrible things. Those are all areas that you should hate. I'm in no way recommending any of these or speaking highly of them. You see, but there's a great many other sins that exist, and there's a great many sins that exist in our culture that we are blind to. Incredible how just in this last week, the governor of Texas declared that there can be no abortions that are allowed to happen because of this virus that is happening. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that there will be so many less abortions happening in the state of Texas during this time, but I more pray that he would have such courage to say such things when there is not a pandemic that is occurring. We're all blind to the sins that exist in our culture. The fish doesn't always know that he is wet. And Jonah is someone who was a Pharisee before the Pharisees existed in the New Testament. Jonah here had a facade of righteousness, a righteousness that existed because of a pedigree, a righteousness that existed because he existed in a certain genealogy. He existed as a person who was called out in a certain way. And he was ignorant of his own sins here. He was ignorant, he was ignorant of the ways in which God had showed mercy to him, had shown mercy and kindness to his people, and he did not desire for that to be shown to other people that he did not appreciate. People who had sinned against him, people who had hurt him in many great ways, people who were probably going to go on to cause great damage to his children or grandchildren probably great-great-grandchildren, if we do the math correctly. See, but we can't just compare sins of yours in your culture to that of another culture. The sin must be compared to the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the offense you have toward someone else, the offense you have toward someone who has hurt you and hurt you in very real ways, you need to remember that that is what you have done to Christ Jesus. And He is one who was righteous and perfect. He is one who came forward as a propitiation for your sins, but deserved not anything that he received. As Paul so eloquently puts in Romans 3 and verses 23 and 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That is the source of our righteousness. And remembering the source of our righteousness requires us to remember the requirement of that righteousness because we had sinned before a righteous and a holy God. And it doesn't matter how great someone else's sin is when you compare your sin to the perfection of Jesus Christ. When you compare your sin to the perfect holy standard of God in his moral law, you always fall short. None of us are sufficient. Don't stand upon a facade of righteousness. Don't stand upon your own pedigree. Don't stand upon the fact that your, your father or your grandfather was a preacher or your grandmother went to church or your mother was someone who was a praying woman. God has no grandchildren, dear friend. So we see this word of the Lord that went forward to Jonah because of the evil that was before the Lord, the evil of his people. But God, being a kind and a merciful God, was sending a messenger to this people. And if they would repent, they would be saved. And thirdly, we see the presence of the Lord. This very sad portion of the Scripture It says this in verse 3, it says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah is someone I want you to see who is not 
highly regarded as a prophet. He, he's not in the, the top ten of prophets in the Old Testament. When you read Hebrews chapter 11 and you see that faith hall of fame, you don't see Jonah's name mentioned there. I find it interesting that in the New Testament, they don't even remember Jonah as being a prophet coming from Galilee. We see this, um, their response to Nicodemus in John 7 and verse 52. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Well, they're actually incorrect. There is a prophet that arises from Galilee, and the name of that prophet is Jonah. But I believe this prophet, Jonah, was held in such a low regard with these people, with these leaders, that they were not even recognizing him or they were not even remembering him as being a prophet who had come from Galilee. Also find it interesting that I'm sure you remember Jonah is the one prophet that Jesus compares himself to, that just as Jonah went into the fish for three days and three nights, so Jesus would die and would rise again. Let's think through Jonah's thought process here. This man who is intentionally leaving the will of God, intentionally walking away from this office that he has been called to, He's a prophet. He's aware of God's attributes. He knows God is everywhere. How is it that he could flee from his presence? You know, in the midst of sin, it is incredible the things that we will forget, the truths that we believed to be so true, the things that we trusted in at other times. We will do things that become completely irrational things that have absolutely no consistent bearing with the real world that is around us. And he's forgetting who Israel is. He, he's forgetting who he, it is that he was called to be as a prophet, who Israel as a nation was called to be. Richard Phillips makes this point. He says, The true God is God of all the earth and all peoples. If it glorifies him to extend saving grace to Israel and those who have taken the name of Christians, it glorifies him just as much to extend the grace of the gospel to every sinner in the world. And we see him doing that here at this time, reaching out to these people who would be forgotten, reaching out to this people. And Jonah here forgot his role. And I find it interesting that just as Adam and Eve had left the presence of the Lord in the garden, we had, see Very similar wording here. That Adam, who was called to work and to keep, that he would be working in this kingdom, that he would be working in this world, that the glory of the Lord would be spread through the work that he would be doing. And here too, Jonah is being called to bring forward the kingdom of God, to spread this truth, to bring forward this truth of a covenant that has been given early in the pages of Scripture, that there is one who will come that you can trust upon him. This is a dominion mandate. He forgot what Israel was called to be. And I want to remind you, dear friends, that Israel is a people that were called to be a light in the world. They were called to be the light of the world. We have that in the garden, in the tabernacle, these ideas. And this is kind of a microcosm of what we are called to be in this life. Think of some of these passages. Uh, Psalm 67 and verses 1 through 3. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, Selah. That your way may be known on the earth, that your saving power among all nations... Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. You have this declaration that the saving power would be known to all of the nations. You need to understand this from a Jewish mindset. This is the idea of these Gentiles, these who are not um, in the kingdom of God, these who are not in covenant with God. And there's this declaration here in the Psalms that these would be people who are saved by God. First Chronicles 16, 23 and 24. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. 
Now, how is that going to happen if the Jews will have absolutely no communication or dealings with anyone else, if they're merely going to put up their walls and not let anyone else go through? You know, one of the ways that people don't often realize that the Word of God was spread throughout the world was the fact that Israel was kind of the doormat of the world, that if they wanted to go to the west, they had to go through Israel. If they wanted to go to the east, you had to go through Israel. And so the people had great opportunity there that as they were hospitable to the people passing through, that the truth of God would pass on to these people. And this is something that did happen. And this is something that was always in the plan of God. We see that in what the Lord says to Abraham, Genesis 12 and verses 2 and 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, and part of this blessing is going forward here from Jonah to Nineveh. This spreading of the blessing through the seed of Abraham that would come about. Because ultimately Christ would come forward from the seed of Abraham. Christ would be the one that brought these things to pass. Israel would fail. Israel would not be the light to the world that they were called to be. Just as Adam failed in the garden, Israel will fail in the promised land. Oh, but Christ. Christ will succeed. Christ is the greater Israel. We see that, and I believe that's clearly communicated through what Matthew writes in Matthew 2, verses 13 through 15. And it says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child and to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And listen here. It says, Out of Egypt I called my son. And it was Israel that was called out of Egypt. It was Israel that came out of Egypt and resided in the promised land. But Matthew here is taking that promise there that was spoken of Israel and it is applying that to Christ, saying that Jesus is the greater Israel. It is through Jesus Christ that there will be a light in the world, that He will bring all nations to the Lord, that He will be ultimately calling a people from every tongue, tribe, in nations, through Christ, what is declared in Psalm 96 will come forward, where it says in verse 3, declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous work among the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Christ Jesus will be the greater Israel that comes forward. He is the one who will be the light in the world. There's many instances of this even in the Old Testament. This isn't something that we're having to wait for to see the Lord reaching out to Gentiles until we get to the New Testament. We see that in Exodus 12 and verse 38. Remember this, it says, A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. This mixed multitude is people that were Egyptians and people that saw the works of the Lord. They saw the ways in which the Lord, the true Lord, was sovereign over these gods in Egypt that were no gods. And they left. They left to be followers of the true God. They left with slaves walking out of the land. There's a long history of prophets in the Old Testament who were speaking to Gentiles. Nahum, obviously, is one who spoke judgment to Nineveh. Jonah certainly is in that. Isaiah chapter 13 communicates to Gentiles. Ezekiel 25 through 32, the prophet of the southern kingdom, is speaking to Gentile nations. Jeremiah 46 through 51 is speaking to Gentile nations, speaking to Moab, to uh, uh, Philistine, the Philistines, to Egypt. You have Daniel and Babylon, that as they are taken out, they are exiled into Babylon. You have Daniel who is there, who is righteous, who is a follower of the Almighty and who influences other people, I believe. You have Obadiah, you have Zephaniah. And think of this, how do we explain the men from the east 
that came forward after the birth of Christ, came forward to worship him. You know, there was the Lord had saved a people for himself. The declaration of this Messiah had gone out into these lands. We see even Elijah ministering amongst Gentiles. First Kings 17. Remember this this um, miracle that was done, this miracle where the widow and her son, their the flour in the jar never went empty. The oil never went empty until the famine was over. Don't think this is something that didn't begin to spread around the neighborhood. Don't think this isn't something that others didn't begin to know about. And Jesus even speaks of this. Jesus being one who did even evangelize to Gentiles. And their response to him was one where they tried to throw him off a cliff when he spoke this to them. See, Jesus is one who declares that he has come forward, and he has come forward like the prophet Jonah, like one who has come forward, and the people won't listen to him, because that's what you have happening. You have the people of Israel who are being rebellious. You have the people in the northern kingdom who are acting in ways that are idolatrous during this time, and they are being um, shown mercy by God And Jonah has been preaching to them, and they are not listening. Elijah and Elisha had been preaching to them, and they are not listening, at least not in any kind of a consistent way. And Jonah is going to go off here, and he's going to preach to the Assyrians in Nineveh, and they are going to hear the word of God spoken by him, and they are going to repent. And this is a message just as much for the people of Israel a message that they need to remember. That there is no pedigree that keeps you in the kingdom of God. God has no grandchildren. Grace is there. Grace is given even to the chief of sinners. Paul, a man who had spent so much of his life terrorizing the church, seeking to snuff out the church, seeking to destroy the church. Grace was given to him. We must see that. We must not be more righteous than God. I think that's what Jonah was being here. He was being more righteous than God. He thought that these were a people who absolutely could not be saved. These were a people who had been so wicked, who had been so evil that they could not be saved. See, but he was justifying by comparison. And in time, where the northern kingdom will go, where the slippery slope of sin will lead them, they will end up sinning in ways that were not even happening in Nineveh. They would, it would have made the people in Nineveh blush if they saw the, the behaviors that were happening in the northern kingdom prior to their exile. But here's what we must see. We must remember that apart being grace given to the chief of sinners, there would be no hope for us. We would be absolutely without hope. The standard whereby we are judged is the perfect law of God, perfect obedience to the law of God, consistent obedience in word and in thought and in deed. And all of us, dear friends, have fallen short. All of us fall short of that. And to fall short is to be completely away from it. It's not as though, well, I almost made it. Any deviation from perfection is to be imperfect. You needed Christ. And Christ, by God's grace, came. Christ, by God's grace, came that we could be saved. And not just us, other people. That this entire world would have people from every tongue, tribe, and nation who are saved, that are there in glory, singing the psalm of the Lamb. Singing to Him because they are a people who have been made in His image. They are a people who rightly should give praise to Him as one who made them, as one whom they are in His image. I greatly look forward to these coming weeks as we'll be walking through this great book, as we consider the ways in which the Word of God was given to Jonah. 
And this is a prophet. It was a prophet who was a sinner himself. This was a prophet who needed salvation himself. This was a prophet who was not willing to accept these other people because of the greatness of their sins. And he, we're not dealing with something that is small. We're dealing with the people who had sinned greatly against Jonah, who had greatly hurt his people, who he believed were going to go on to hurt his people in the future. But the grace of God and the mercy of God was extending even here to these that Jonah despised, these people who were made in the image of God, these even animals the Lord is showing kindness toward. And he'll say that at the end of the book. Aren't these cattle of some worth? Aren't, aren't these people of importance? Thirdly, we see this presence of the Lord, this fleeing from the presence of the Lord, which Jonah walked toward as he ran from the command of God. You just remember, dear friends, there is no safer place to be than in the presence of God. There is no safer place that you can reside, that you can exist, than to be in the will of God. It is there, dear friends, where you will find the greatest peace. It is there, dear friends, that you will find the greatest joy. Earthly comforts will wax and they will wane. These are times where we know that for sure. These are things that we cannot lean upon, we cannot trust upon. And I pray that even times like this would be a reminder to us of the reality of what we see in Scripture, the reality that we know, that we are taught, that we have proclaimed, that this world is not our home. Oh, dear friends, I pray that you would be seeking first the kingdom of God, that you would desire with what the Lord has given you, with the capacities and influences that the Lord has given you, with the abilities that the Lord has given you, that you would be seeking to speak truth into the lives of those that are given to you, that we would not show prejudice of any kind in the ways in which we preach the gospel to others, that we would be a people that are open to share the grace of God as God has been open to us to share His grace with us, apart from which we would be without hope. Oh, dear friends, let's pray. Father God, I come before you as one who is without hope apart from Christ. We confess to you that we are a people who would be without hope apart from Christ. Father, I pray that you would be working in us, that you would be breaking from us the idols that exist in our lives and in our minds and in our hearts, that as you do your good work in us, that the ways in which we cling to this world, the ways in which we hope in this world, would begin to break away, that we would not cling to dust we would not seek to grasp sand in our fist, but we would seek to stand upon the rock of Jesus Christ. We would humbly walk the righteous path in obedience to Christ Jesus, not because of any goodness in ourselves, but because of what Christ has done for us, knowing that because Christ has acted on our behalf, we have been given in Christ, more than we could ever be granted in this world. And I pray this all in the name of our precious Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.